This is part one of once the mighty Assyrian Empire who thought they were indestructible, but they were so cruel, God had to bring an end to it. In this presentation you will hear about the greatest party ever held, the humiliation of an Israelite king. Meet the Assyrian king who repented when Jonah predicted the destruction of Nineveh. You will be richly rewarded for time spent watching this presentation. Egypt was the first world empire that endeavoured to destroy God's people. And what happened to them? Well, eventually they were destroyed. And then history tells us that the Assyrian Empire became the next world power that tried to destroy God's people. And what happened to the mighty Assyrian Empire? They disappeared from the scene of history. Every time I visit the archaeological sites of this ancient empire, I think of the fulfillment of one of the most amazing prophecies in the Old Testament. It was written by a Hebrew prophet during the time of the mighty Assyrian king Ashur Banipal, who ruled from 669 to 627 BC. Zephaniah chapter 2 verses 13 to 15 He will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, leaving Nineveh utterly desolate and dry as the desert. Flocks and herds will lie down there, creatures of every kind. The desert owl and the screech owl will roost on her columns. Their calls will echo through the windows, rubble will be in the doorways. The beams of cedar will be exposed. This is the carefree city that lived in safety, she said to herself. I am and there is none besides me. What a ruin she has become, a lair for wild beasts. All who pass by her scoff and shake their fists. When you look at the ruins of the ancient Assyrian capitals like Ashur, Nineveh, Kosabat and Nimrut, you appreciate the accuracy of Bible prophecy. These ruins, another prophet called Nahum refers to the destruction of the Egyptian city of Thebes called Karnak by the Assyrians. Let's read it. Nahum chapter 3 verses 8 to 10. Are you better than Thebes, situated on the Nile with water around her? The river was a defence, the waters a wall. Cush and Egypt were her boundless strength. Put and Libya were among her allies. She was taken captive and went into exile. Her infants were dashed to pieces at the head of every street. Lots were cast for her nobles, and all her great men were put in chains. Can archaeology confirm the biblical prediction and fulfillment of the destruction of this mighty Egyptian city by the Assyrians? Yes. I discovered this prism in the Louvre in Paris where King Ashurbanipal tells how he destroyed Thebes in 663 BC. The Bible is such a reliable book. Here you are looking at a relief of Assyrian soldiers fighting the Egyptians. But while Assyria was still at the height of its power, the prophet Nahum and Zephaniah predicted its imminent fall. But why did God destroy the Assyrian Empire and bury its glory beneath the Mesopotamian sands? Is God a cruel tyrant just ready to punish his enemies? No. This mighty empire became so cruel that God had to put an end to it. He couldn't allow them to continue their acts of cruelty forever and ever because he cares for persecuted people. You are looking at a very humiliating piece of art. Cruel Assyrians taking God's people into exile. Maybe you're in a similar situation right now. Some sinful habit or some kind of herd is exiling you into a far-off land of slavery. Listen to this message of comfort that God sent his enslaved people so many years ago. The message applies to you and me. Name 113, now I will break the yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. Englishman Austin Henry Layard began his digging at a site called Nimrut, not far from the modern city of Mosul. Within 24 hours he discovered the palace of Ashur Nasarpal II. This cruel tyrant ruled from 884 to 859 BC. 
Ashur Nasrpal used to live at Ashur, the first Assyrian capital. At these temples he worshipped the war god Ashur who lived in the Himran mountains. But then he moved his capital to Nimrut, the biblical Kala, where he built himself an enormous palace. I presume that the building of the palace was such a success that the king you're looking at had to celebrate his accomplishments. A stealer discovered in 1951 says that he invited 69,574 guests and entertained them for 10 days. What was on the menu? Let's read it. 2,200 oxen, 16,000 sheep, 10,000 bags of wine and 10,000 barrels of beer. What a party! I carefully checked the cuneiform inscription but couldn't find any detail concerning the type of hangover the guests experienced. When I visited the huge banquet hall where Belshazzar had a similar banquet with a thousand guests, I appreciated the reliability of the book of Daniel. Biblical data is never far-fetched. Ancients feasted in a superlative way. The Bible tells us that a successful, brave king by the name of Ahab ruled here at Samaria. Can archaeology confirm this biblical fact? Yes, it can. Archaeologists discovered cuneiform material giving the name of the next Assyrian king who ruled from Nimrud. He was called Shalmaneser III. Now this is very exciting. He mentions a battle against the Syrian coalition which took place at Karkar on the Orontes River in 853 BC. And then he mentions the name of King Ahab who had a total of 10,000 soldiers and 2,000 chariots. Here you are looking at the Orontes River in Syria where this ancient battle took place. Biblical archaeology is exciting. The more I discover the truth of the Bible in the light of the signs of archaeology, the more I revere this inspired book. 1 Kings 19.16 says that the 11th king of Israel was called Jehu. He was noted for his furious chariot driving. Can we believe what the Bible says about him? Yes. According to some scholars, the destructive Baal worship originated at Baal Bek in Lebanon. The Bible says that Jehu was the king who began to cleanse Israel from this degrading heathen worship. When I looked at this representation of Baal, the god of fertility, I thought of Jehu. After he exterminated the royal house of Ahab, which started Baal worship in Israel, he killed the rest of the Baal worshippers in Israel. But was there really a king like Jehu in Israel? Can archaeology confirm this biblical account? Yes, it can. While Austin Henry Layard was digging in Nimrud, he came across this impressive black obelisk which you can now view in the British Museum. Guess what he found when they deciphered the cuneiform writing? The name of the Israelite king called Jehu. On this panel you see him kneeling before King Shalmaneser III. Behind the kneeling king are seen Israelite officials bringing their tribute to the Assyrian king. This is the only contemporary representation of an Israelite king in the archaeological world. What caused his humiliation and downfall? The Bible says that at Dan he worshipped the golden calves. Let us read this verse. 2 Kings 10 verse 29 However, he did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit, the worship of the golden calves at Bethel and Dan. Can archaeology confirm the biblical data that ancients worshipped bulls? Yes, for sure. The earliest form of bull worship is found in Egypt where they worshipped the sacred Apis bull. He was considered the earthly representative of the god Ptah. I found 40 huge sarcophagi when I visited the Serapium at the steppe pyramid of Soser at Saqqara. Mummified bulls were buried here. You can heartily believe the Bible on this issue.
Maybe Jehu thought that by worshipping golden calves he would be protected from the mighty Assyrians who also worshipped bulls. But he was wrong. Our only safety lies in a trusting relationship with the unseen God of the universe. Jehu was humiliated, put in bondage and had to pay taxes to Shalmaneser III because of his disobedience to God. May God help you and me to obey him and enjoy the freedom he offers his obedient children. Tribute of Jehu, son of Omri, silver gold and a golden bowl, a golden beaker, golden goblets, pitchers of gold, lead, staves for the hand of the king, javelins are received from him. This is a quotation from the Jehu inscription. What a thrill to see biblical names on ancient Assyrian documents. I was more than excited when I saw the name of the Syrian king Adat Nirari III in the British Museum. I'll tell you why. He was the king who repented at the preaching of the prophet Jonah. But let me tell you a little of his background. His mother was called Samuramat, originally from Babylon, the very first Semiramus. She was such a powerful person that some ancients said that she was responsible for the reconstruction of Babylon. But they were wrong. The Bible says it was Nebuchadnezzar. I was so thrilled when I saw this original brick on which Nebuchadnezzar states that he is the builder of the new Babylon. You are looking at another amazing confirmation of biblical truth. Initially, Adat Nirari III was just as cruel as his predecessors were. He conquered King Hazael of Damascus, which is also mentioned in the Bible. When archaeologists checked the Assyrian annals on the history of Adat Nirari III, they found the name of Hazael. It is spelled Haza Ilu and Mari. Among the tribute Hazael had to pay to the Assyrians to avert a total destruction of Damascus was a bed inlaid with ivory. Here you are looking at samples of ivory found at Nimrut. Jesus grew up at Nazareth. He was the most obedient son who ever lived on earth. Not far from here at Gath Hefer lived a prophet by the name of Jonah. God told him to go to Nineveh and warn the city of its impending destruction because of its wickedness. When you study the history of this cruel nation, you appreciate Jonah's hesitancy to go preach to them. Anyway, who cares about cruel people? As I walked amongst the ruins of ancient Assyria, I thought of how these cruel people and their king became kind, converted people at the preaching of Jonah. Jonah 3 verses 8 and 9 But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Can archaeology confirm this biblical miracle of conversion? Yes. The Assyrian annals tell us the amazing story that cruel king Adatnirari III, who ruled at this time, became a monotheist. But that's not all. Suddenly a moratorium is placed on all military campaigns. When I looked at this Assyrian war relief, I thought of the kind and loving God we serve. How did he respond to their positive behavioural change? And how does he respond when modern sinners change their ways? Jonah 3.10 When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. If God could change cruel Assyrians into kind Assyrians, he can do the same for you and me. I discovered this interesting statue of a specific Assyrian king in the Louvre Museum at Paris. Who is he? I looked at the French inscription at the bottom and read the name of Tichlat Pileser. Long before archaeologists deciphered the cuneiform name of this king, the Bible mentioned him. Let's read it. 1 Chronicles 5 verse 26 So the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pul, king of Assyria, that is Tichlat Pileser, king of Assyria, 
who took the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh into exile. He took them to Hala, that is northeast of Nineveh, Habor, a river of Mesopotamia, one of the main tributaries of the upper Euphrates, and Hara, and the river of Gozan, where they are to this day. Archaeologists identified some of these places, and guess what? They found proof of Israelite exiles who lived here. You know, small details like these assure me of a caring God. If you are an exile in the far-off land of rejection and guilt, just remember, God cares about you and even knows your address. Cuneiform writings from Assyria, please tell us. Are you also aware of a king called Tiglat Pileser III, which is mentioned in scripture? Yes, comes the reply, especially when it concerns the ten tribes of Israel. Let's read one more Bible text before we check the Assyrian annals on this issue. 2 Kings 15.10 Then Pul, king of Assyria, invaded the land, and Mahnahem gave him a thousand talents of silver to gain his support and strengthen his own hold on the kingdom. Can we get Assyrian confirmation on this biblical statement? Yes. The exact amount of tribute from Manahem is mentioned in the display description that was found in Tiglat Pileser's palace at Nimrut. They also discovered the name of King Azariah of Judah who paid tribute to him. As for Manahem, terror overwhelmed him like a bird. Alone he fled and submitted to me. To his place I brought him back, and silver, coloured woolen garments, linen garments are received as tribute. This comes from the Manahem inscription. When I looked at the relief of Tiglat Pileser III, I thought of the Assyrian version of his name, Tukulti Apel Asahara, which means my trust is in the god Ninib. Where do we put our trust? When Nabopolassa and his son Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and Sahacharis from Ekbatana attacked the Syrians in 612 BC, their gods were powerless to save them. Only the God of heaven and earth can help us in times of crises. For many centuries the Syrians placed their trust in the gods of their imaginations. Their huge bulls with human heads were symbols of an undefeatable and indestructible civilization. Today these huge Assyrian winged bulls speak of a defeated empire. But they also invite us to place our trust only in a God who never fails people who come to him for help. Visiting these dangerous places in Iraq takes a lot of inspiration and perspiration. At times even your good friends become a little irritable with you. But when you come across such evidences that confirm the truth of the Bible, you are doubly rewarded. The Bible takes on a new meaning, a personal one, and you are encouraged to study it just more and more and more. Tichlat Pileser III was the first king to introduce wholesale transplantations of subjugated nations to other countries. Why? Well, he wanted to uproot them, kill their nationalistic spirit, destroy old loyalties, and in this way to establish his Assyrian reign over his conquered peoples. By the way, Tichlat Pileser also ruled over Babylon and accepted the Babylonian throne name of Pul. These are just small details to help us understand why the Bible also calls him Pul. You are looking at the ruins of the Temple of Ashur. History tells us that before the Assyrians began any military campaign, they first consulted their cruel god of war. On one such an occasion they asked Ashur, the god of war, whether they should go up to Israel and destroy the capital of Samaria. The answer was positive because the devil knew Israel had severed their relationship with Yahweh, their God. Let us ask the Bible to tell us more about this Assyrian king. 2 Kings 17 verse 3 Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up to attack Hoshea. 
who had been Shalmaneser's vassal and had paid him tribute. When you study the Assyrian military successes of those days, you really feel sorry for their victims. The mighty Assyrian army was approaching the ten tribes with a vengeance. And because they had neglected their relationship with God, they had no protection against the enemy. 2 Kings 17 verse 5 The king of Assyria invaded the entire land, marched against Samaria and laid siege to it for three years. Every time I visit the ruins of ancient Samaria, I think of the sad fate of this once prosperous city. Can you imagine the starving Israelites who died during this siege? Mothers even ate their newborn babes. This is what willful stubbornness does to people. 2 Kings 17 verse 6 In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. He settled them in Hala, in Gozan, on the Habor River, and in the towns of the Medes. History tells us that Shalmaneser V died during the last year of the siege and was succeeded by Sargon II. You will hear more about this very interesting king in our next lecture. I felt so sorry for these men swimming through a river. They are fleeing from the cruel Assyrian soldiers. Once they are captured, they will be exiled to a strange land of hardships. They have not much of a chance. If the Assyrian arrows hit their inflated skins, they will drown. Their chances of survival are very, very slim. At times we find ourselves in similar predicaments. Unpleasant circumstances beyond our control takes us to places where we don't want to be. A third party may be breaking up your marriage and you are being exiled to a foreign land of loneliness and rejection. Maybe you've lost your health and are being exiled to the painful land of the invalids. I have good news for you. Jesus, the sinner's friend who died for our sins, is coming soon to rescue us from the land of bondage. He's going to take us home to a land of eternal happiness. I long for citizenship in that land of eternity. I long for the land of eternal security. I long for the land of eternal health. I long for the land of eternal happiness. I long for the land of eternal bliss. What about you? But there is one condition before you and I can get to that tearless land. We have to confess our utter helplessness and accept God's mighty ability to help us. Are you willing to do it? You cannot afford to miss the next lecture. You'll be introduced to King Sargon II. French archaeologists discovered his palace at a place called Korsabat, north of Nineveh. I went to this famous historical site. Let's clear the sands and see what appears. Just look at this. Fantastic. You cannot afford to miss part two of this series. Once you've studied the contents of the clay tablets and the clay cylinders, the Bible becomes more real. I tried to speak a few words to the posterity of the Assyrian kings of long ago, but they didn't understand me. The king who ruled here, Sargon II, had a son by the name of Sennacherib. He was the great builder who beautified Nineveh. He was also a mighty warrior. In our follow-up lecture, we'll hear more about his attack on Babylon, the greatest city the world has ever seen. Archaeologists also discovered a few panels on which he depicts the siege and destruction of one of the fortified cities of Judah. Please don't miss this fascinating story. His son, Esarhaddon, is also mentioned in the Bible. His palace and arsenal were only discovered in 1990. I'm going to take you to this place where archaeologists made the biggest find in the past hundred years. The last great Assyrian king was called Ashurbanipal. He transplanted people from Susa, the capital of the Elamites, to Samaria. 
You are looking at a relief depicting this transplantation. Archaeologists also excavated a huge library in Nineveh belonging to this king. I want to assure you that your admiration for God's holy word will grow after attending this lecture. You will discover new dimensions to the meaning of life as you delve into the history of these ancient civilizations. I hope you found this information as interesting as I did. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we can hear your voice speaking to us through the experiences of kings and empires of the past. Please help us not to be cruel, but kind and more considerate of fellow men. Amen.